Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. Someone once said about Israel's deliverance from bondage, quote, it took one day to get Israel out of Egypt, but it took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel, end quote. Many have said the same thing about black people in America, that the slave mentality is still present in our thinking. But is there any truth to that statement? The Reverend C.L. Bryant, ordained pastor, speaker, author, and movie producer will join us to talk about his movie, quote, Runaway Slave, and partisan politics. We'll discuss this and more when we return. Welcome to Kingdoms in Conflict. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Wallace. With us today, we're privileged to have C.L. Bryant. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastically well, Doc. Thank you so much for having me on. It's our, our privilege. Now, you know this is a Christian TV show, so uh, and not everyone who comes on is a Christian, but when they are, generally speaking, want to have folks share a little bit of their testimony. Would, would you mind telling people how you came to the Lord? I became involved with all of this. Uh, as uh, you know, Doc, I'm the former president of the NAACP in Garland, Texas, back in the mid 80s, nearly 35. Uh, well, it's been a long time ago. And um, my friends, uh, I was approached to speak at a pro-choice rally. And of course, I was a minister, uh, pastoring minister of evangelism at the time. And I realized that when I refused to do that, Dr. Benjamin Hooks, who was the regional, who was the national director of the NAACP, um, my star abruptly began to go down. It was rising rapidly and, event, and uh, almost effectively, it went down. And so I told my wife, Jane, who's gone on to be with the Lord now, that, you know, they just don't want to control me. They want to control the agenda and use me as a tool to control people. And so I walked away from the NAACP, not really knowing anything about uh, who I truly was as a conservative. But then I discovered um, something driving around in Florida where my wife and I moved to. Uh, it was a guy by the name of Rush. And uh, I heard him really bashing Bill Clinton. And I realized that some of the things that he was saying about conservative values were the same values that my father, my grandfather, and even I embraced. And so there was an awakening that did come at that point in time over 30 years ago, Doc, and it was over the issue of life, the issue of abortion. So is, is that your testimony, how you became more of a conservative or how you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Oh, how I know that came to know Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the Jesus Christ part. I thought you asked me a conservative part. I, I grew up in the church. In fact, I was practically born in the church. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother, um, uh, just you and I will know what I'm talking about. My grandmother basically ran the church that uh, uh, that was down <laughs> in uh, in the country. And so, and then my mother and father uh, were church people. My father was a deacon of the church. And so uh, I, I grew up in the church, became a Christian at the age of five years old, was baptized at mm -hmm. the age of five, confessed Jesus Christ at that point in time. Uh, my life has taken many different directions, branches, and so forth, but through it all, uh, the direction and the upbringing that I received from my parents and my grandparents uh, has indeed kept me to where I am uh, in going in the way that I should go because I was trained up as a child to go in that direction. So, CL, let me, let me ask you about the, the video that you did, the documentary called Runaway Slave. How did you get involved in that? What, what was the impetus to get you to... To do that documentary. Once I left the NAACP, uh, Doc, I began to think of ways that our people had been used and abused in the past. And I began to think about how that method of enslaving and trapping them was creating a system. My mentor and one of my good friends who's going on to be with the Lord now, Herman Cain, Mm. Uh, had always described it as a plantation type of system. And Herman appears in the movie. Everybody's in the film from Dr. Thomas Sowell to Glenn Beck to Andrew Breitbart, Star Parker. Everyone, uh, listen, Dick Gregory's in the film, Julian Bonds in the film. Everyone's in the film. Jesse Jackson, as well as Al Sharpton are in the movie. And 
when I made that film to put together the scenario of how we were being misled by those who we trusted, like the black preacher, when I put that movie together, my deacons at my church lost their minds, man. They, they just could not believe it. First, the uh, tea party. Okay, mm -hmm. pastor, we put up with that. You have your right to your own political opinions, yada, yada, yada. But now this movie, this is a, this pastor, this is a national thing. I mean, uh, we're, we're going to be a laughing stock, you know, yada, yada, yada. That's what they were saying. That's the way they felt. Now, here I was, Eric. I had been with them for nearly nine years. I had buried my uh, dead. I had married my young people off. I went to visit my sick, and they had recovered. Gotten my young people, many of them, out of jail. But they chose Barack Obama over me. And it was an issue of skin. And it was an emotional attachment that we do, everyone has it, I suppose, to skin color, which is absolutely diabolical because it causes us to miss out on the greater good of who we are as human beings when we well, only see our color. And so that's how I lost my church. Well, and let, that's let, let, how let me ask happened. you this. You, you said something about choosing Barack Obama over you. Explain what you mean by that. Well, Ob Barack Obama uh, was indeed the most diabolical deception that I believe has ever come down the pike. In fact, we're where we are in America right now because of the words that he said right before he was elected. In just five days from now, we will have a fundamental change in America. I saw that fundamental change uh, coming through him and I warned them about Barack Obama. Barack Obama, how in the world would he come see you if you got sick? And he never did. How would he get your kids out of jail? No, more black uh, men went to jail uh, when Barack Obama was uh, president of the United States because jobs for young black men was very scarce and crime by ne almost necessity uh, went up in the inner city black community. And so I saw this, the, the, the spirit of God allowed me to see this word of knowledge, whatever you want to call it, word of wisdom, whatever you want to call it, came to me. And I said this to my people. And believe me, they chose him over their pastor. And so the Lord blessed me and he's continued to bless me. <clears throat> and so I am very proud that I was able to follow him by faith through perhaps one of the darkest times of my wife and my life is losing a church because you had to take a stand. You had to shake the dust off your feet even because they failed to listen. They would not listen to what I was trying to tell them. So part of your story is that you took a stand. Well, you did Runaway Slave, which talked about leaving the um, liberal progressive plantation, if you will, to, you know, to uh, talk about your conservative values, being pro-life, pro-traditional marriage and all of that. Um, it got your deacons and people in the church upset and be, because you took that stand and it actually became vocal against uh, Barack Obama. So what, so what led you, so now you're, you're out and about and you're talking about um, conservative principles, you know, wherever, wherever you're sent. Um, I know you're doing some work now with, with a group called Freedom Works. Is that, is that where you went to next or is there a stage in between the Freedom Works? When I gave my first uh, speech, uh, Tea Party speech, I'll call it, Mm -hmm. uh, on uh, April 9, 2009, you can still get it on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, it went viral mm -hmm. and Freedom Works saw it. They were planning a march on Washington uh, and 1.5 million showed up there at that march. And I was invited to speak to that crowd. And there was a marriage after my speech there that did occur with myself and president of Freedom Works at that time, Matt Kibbe. And uh, the marriage has lasted now for 12 years. And I am a senior fellow with Freedom Works, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, grassroots organization in the nation. We boast 6.1 uh, million activists on the ground around the nation. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as we speak, speaking to some of those activists, and I'll be talking to some of them here tonight just got off of a tour with Nigel Farage. Uh, you were there 
uh, in Chicago when we were there and glad to see you, Doc, uh, when you came out. And so that was a progression from being a speaker at a Tea Party event. I, I never planned it. I never thought about it. Never. My wife and I were over there paying taxes that day on April 15th. And uh, I saw signs that there was some tea party going on. I, I said, honey, let's see what this is. And I showed up, Eric, and I, I was truly the only black person there that, that I could see anyway. And so, uh, you know, they asked me to say something. And I said, about what? About high taxes. Well, I just paid my taxes. <laughs> so easily I uh -huh. could say to them, okay, I'll be happy to. And so that's what I did. I, uh, I spoke to them that day about high taxes and you and I are talking about it today, all these years later. So Freedom Works, I'd understood that Freedom Works is more libertarian in their, in their viewpoint. So how should Christians, um, what is the message for Christians that you're bringing through Freedom Works? The good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel good news of America are one and the same when you're talking about a Judeo-Christian nation. Freedom Works, even though it does, in fact, uh, lean in some libertarian ways, but you have congressmen like Thomas Massey, uh, Mike Lee, Rand Paul, uh, Ted Cruz, when you talk about senators, and uh, you know people like Mark Meadows, all of them are Freedom Works and were Freedom Works candidates. And so even though, yes, uh, some of our leanings have been uh, toward libertarianism, but all of our leanings are toward the republic and building, educating, and mobilizing the largest grassroots organization in the nation is our goal. And that is to champion the principles of less government and lower taxes, more freedom, because freedom works. That is our mantra. Because freedom works. I like that. I, I want to go back to your, your documentary just you know one more time. Uh, that was, what, what year was that that you actually did that, that documentary? Right. We made that film back in 2012. Okay. Back so in 2012. And it was ago. way ahead of its time. Yeah, right, right, because right. Because all of the things that your Candace Owens, who is a disciple of mine, I know she had to see the movie. All the things that so many uh, black conservatives who have cropped up in the last 12 years, all the things that they're championing and talking about, we had that in our film at the time. And uh, all the, leaving the plantation and all that plantation talk, that came directly from uh, Runaway Slave. And uh, we encouraged the people who came behind us to be who they are. Uh, you know, it's an amazing thing, Eric, uh, when you do something like we were able to do with Runaway Slave, uh, the greatest uh, form of flattery and the greatest compliment is to be imitated. And if you go back and look at Runaway Slave that was made, that was made uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, when you look at Runaway Slave, uh, you will see the, it being echoed in the voices of even those who hold Blacks who hold political office, and even those who are progressive or not progressive, but conservative whites, when they talk to Black people, a lot of those talking points come directly from a movie that was made nine years ago. So you think things have gotten worse since you, since you made that film? Is, it, is your film more apropos today with the likes of BLM, Black Lives Matter, Critical Race Theory, and the 1619 Project to try to get people away from the liberal progressive side of the aisle that doesn't always seem to tell the truth or hold the truth for that matter. I mean, one of the, one of the tenets of uh, critical race theory is that the narrative is more important than the actual truth. So uh, do you think your, your film is more apropos today than even what it was when you, when, when you made it? I absolutely uh, think it is. Um, and one of the things uh, when you call to talk about Black Lives Matter and, and all of that, my grandfather, you've heard me say this before, Eric, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this to your audience now. My grandfather, an illiterate man, uh, you know, WG was his uh, initials. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, 
he, he didn't, couldn't spell, neither could his father. That's how most of the men in our family wound up with initials for names. My father's name up until he went to World War II was LC, that was his name. And uh, his brother was JC and uh, his other brother was WC. And so my, like I said, uh, you know, WG was my grandfather. And so the idea, my name's Cleon Lewis, but daddy and my grandfather encouraged me always carry on the initials so that you don't ever forget how humble uh, a family you came from and how God has blessed us. And so when we look at that and we look at uh, where we come from and, and how the Lord has blessed us, I want you to know that this runaway slave uh, movie was done because I am the child, the, the seed of men who paid the price mm. for me to be here. They never conformed. My, my grandfather, even though he was the son of an illiterate man, he was very productive. He was his own man cut pulpwood for a living. Before you know it, he had three trucks of his own and employing nearly 30 men. Wow. And I still own a portion of that land down there. That land once belonged to the slave holders, but the Confederate dollar collapsed, of course, after the Confederacy collapsed. And my great grandparents worked for that property and bought it with American greenback from the former slave owners. Mm. And so when I talk about runaway slaves, I talk about people who didn't do what they did in the time that they did it because they were dependent upon government. They had run away. They had, they had broken free from what had shackled them and found the only true freedom in America. And that is the principles of capitalism and bringing to the table your own content of character and then letting that work for you in the free market system. So the marriage between me and Freedom Works and even the film, Runaway Slave, is a stream that runs down the same river. The last thing I wanna ask you, the state of the church in America, um, especially the black church, uh, knowing you're a former, former pastor, how do you see things today? Is there a gloomy outlook for, as you look at things or do you see hope? When I consider that question, Eric, you know, what God did by removing me from my uh, physical pulpit, he expanded my ministry in a way that I could never have imagined. I, 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 I'm speaking and, and almost for the last 12 years solidly, uh, whether I was in my church, because I've only been gone from my church for nine years now, but I've been with Freedom Works for 12. Uh, but, but this is the thing. When I left my pulpit, my pulpit actually blew up in ways that, as I mentioned, could never, I could never have imagined. And, and instead of uh, preaching to the four or 500, 600 sometimes on Sunday that we did every Sunday, I'm now speaking to thousands of people uh, across the nation. And even though I did quite a few revivals when I was doing revivals back uh, when I was pastoring, uh, none of them gathered the type of crowds that this journey has taken me on here since I paid the price to be what God is directing me to be. The state of the black church, the tribal chief of that black church is the pastor. And unfortunately, that black pastor has been co-opted uh, far too often by people who mean the community no good. And pastor, I'll speak to you right now. It is time for men and women of, in ministry and clergy mm -hmm. to have backbone. We cannot be weak, limp, or lily liver any longer, and our people survive. There is an all that assault on the church of God, and particularly the mind of black people and that attack, unfortunately, is coming too often, not all, not all black pulpits, but too often through the black preacher who has been co-opted by the Democrat party. Amen, brother. Um, I know I said that was the last question, but 
just like you when you do your second close. <laughs> What is what is the what is the hope for America? Where, the where hope is for the America hope? is telling our young people the truth, Doc. The truth is, all of us have been through the toils and snares of this growing experiment called America. And the truth is also this: there is not one thing in that room in the past. If you walk into that room of the past, you can see the pictures on the wall. Uh, you can even experience the memories of the past. You can see the furniture that's in that room in the past, but doc, you know, there's not one thing that you can change in that room. There's not one memory that you can change in that room. And the truth that we must tell our young people is that there is nothing that we can do about grandpa's pain. There's nothing we can do about great grandpa's pain or the pain of what they endured through the struggles of slavery. But we can be grateful and we can look at ourselves as victors instead of victims because we are the children of those who survived. Red, yellow, black, and white, whoever you are in this country right now, you, you're the children of those who are survivors in this great experiment, and black people in particular you had better look at yourself, not as people who have been trampled on. You are people who were trampled on and were able to survive and thrive anyway. And Doc, you and I are proof positive that that is the truth. And so that's the hope of our future, is to give our young people that message instead of the one that they're being poisoned by with these Democrats. Look, brother, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on the program today. We're gonna, we're gonna have to have you back on. Uh, my man C.L. Bryant in Oklahoma right now. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon. And those who are watching, we'll be back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Wallace, president and co-founder of Freedom's Journal Institute for the study of faith and public policy. And I'm here today to tell you about a project that we're really excited about. It's called Racism in America and the Role of the Church. We live in a time and day of conspiracy, a threat to the poor, a threat to the have-nots. We're doing this series because we believe that the black church needs to hear another voice. There's a voice out there that is secular. Society as well as the media are pushing the narrative that there's a resurgence in racism in America especially with the rise of, of groups like Black Lives Matter and other protest groups. It's tearing the church apart. And I believe it's time for the, for the church in general, and the African American church in particular, to have a, a, another voice that has a different point of view, a biblical worldview. I'd ask you to prayerfully consider making a donation to this project. Thank you. Welcome back. Let my people go is a familiar refrain we remember from the mouth of Moses as he addressed Pharaoh of Egypt. In Hebrew, it's only two words, shalek et ami. And it's not a suggestion, but a command. Moses will repeat this command at least nine times, starting in chapter five, verse one. However, before we get to the confrontation between Moses and Pharaoh, we must first understand God's involvement in the plan. God is mentioned for the first time in Exodus chapter two, verse 23. We are told that, quote, their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, end quote. In the following verses, 24 through 25, we are told that God, quote, heard their groanings, remembered his covenant, saw the people, and, quote, knew, end quote. Even though what God knew was not clearly stated, he knows the condition of the Israelites and is about to become involved at a level never seen before. God has a plan. And in the following verses in chapter 3, that plan is fleshed out. The angel of the Lord appears to Moses in a burning bush in verses two through four. Moses is told not to come near and take off his shoes. Moses is standing on holy ground. God identifies himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in verse six. It serves as a restatement or remembrance of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse seven is a restatement of what God has said in chapter two of God's awareness of Israel's predicament. The Lord says, I have seen their affliction, heard their cry, 
and know their suffering. These are statements of God's involvement. In verse 8, we know the result. Quote, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, end quote. They will be taken to what will be called the land of promise. Let me rephrase this. The mistreatment of the Israelites has come to God's attention. God has heard, remembered, seen, and knows. The cry has gone up, and as a result, God has come down. God is intimately involved and re reveals his plan to Moses. In verse 9, God restates that he has heard the people's cry and seen the oppression of the Egyptians. Thus, I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh. Now, Moses is cool with God's plan up until this point. But in the following few verses, Moses will complain. Why me? I can't speak. What's your name? <laughs> and what shall I say? God identifies himself as the I am who I am or I will be whom I will be. Thus Moses will go and declare to Pharaoh, let my people go. God has initiated a plan to free his people to worship and serve his purposes. He will do the same in the New Testament. He will come down in human flesh and set us free through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. The Gospel of John tells us that Jesus has come to set us free. John 8, 31 through 32, quote, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free." End quote. The practice of sin causes bondage in verse 34. A person is made a slave to sin because of practicing sin. But if, quote, the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, end quote, verse 36. Later in the chapter, Jesus will identify himself with the I am of Exodus. As John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus says, quote, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, end quote. In the Exodus story and the advent of Jesus, the purpose of God is to set people free from physical, mental, and spiritual slavery. We are to be free to serve God, the creator and the maker of heaven and earth. So in a sense, we all are runaway slaves who have escaped the bondage of the world system if we are faithful followers of Christ. As free people, our ultimate allegiance should be to the kingdom, not a political party. Thus, Freedom's Journal Institute and C.L. Bryant and others like us are calling on the people of God to escape the bondage of political plantation that says, if you don't vote for someone, you're not black. Escape from those who equate blackness with voting a particular way. Walk in your freedom as the disciple of Jesus Christ and let God's people go away from Black Lives Matter, critical race theory, and the anti-racist propaganda. The Apostle Peter warned us in 2 Peter 2, 19 through 20, quote, they promised them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first." End quote. We are kingdoms in conflict, therefore we choose to follow Christ.